Good evening and welcome to the University of Zurich. It's a pleasure to host this event together with our partners, Swiss Re and the UBS Center. Tonight we will hear about an issue that only a few of us know from personal experience. Living in a privileged society like Switzerland, poverty is something that you can easily oversee. However, if you take a closer look, you will find people living on the brink of poverty even here in Switzerland. In other parts of the world, poverty is a part of daily life. Uh, according to the most recent estimates from the World Bank, 10, roughly 11% of the world's population live on less than $2 a day. That are bad news. The good news is that there has been marked progress on reducing poverty over the last few decades. Nearly 1.1 billion people have moved out of extreme poverty since 1990. That's down from 35% in 1990 to roughly 11% of the world population in 2013. Of course, despite the progress made in reducing poverty, the number of people living in extreme poverty globally remains unacceptably high. To contribute better solutions for this problem, the Department of Economics has recently heavily invested in the area of development economics. We hired several new professors in this area, and we have founded, with the help of strong partners such as Swiss Re and the UBS Center, the Zurich Center for Economic Development. The center conducts cutting-edge uh, research on many topics related to poverty alleviation and economic prosperity. And here you can see uh, the homepage of this uh, <laughs> Zurich Center for Economic Development. And here you see uh, the web address. Now, because of our strong interest in these topics, we have also invited today's speakers, Abhijit Banerjee and Astrid Duflo, who have dedicated themselves to reduce poverty around the globe through the conduct of rigorous economic research and the design of better policy. To this end, they founded JPAL, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT, together with Sandil Mulanathan in, 20, in 2003. Their mission to reduce poverty by ensuring that policy is informed by scientific evidence, uh, that's their mission. They do this through research, policy outreach, and training across six regional offices worldwide. JPAL is a network of 145 affiliated professors from 49 universities. It is an honor to have the two founders and directors of this important initiative here tonight, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee. Let me say a few words about Abhijit and Esther. Abhijit is the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at MIT and one of the two directors of JPAL, the other is Esther. He is the author of a large number of articles and various books, including Poor Economics, which have kind of an, has kind of an ambiguous title, doesn't it? <laughs> so it could be economics about poverty allevi alleviation, but it could also be read in a different way, poor economists. <laughs> so probably that was intended. In 2011, the foreign policy magazine named Professor Banerjee as one of the top 100 global thinkers. Most recently, he served on the UN Secretary General's high-level <laughs> panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. Esther is also a director and founder of JPAL. She is currently the editor of the American Economic Review, probably our most important journal, scientific journal in the field of economics, a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy of Sciences. Esther and Abhijit have both received numerous academic honors and prizes and I believe more, we can expect more to come. Both Duflo and Banerjee have been among those scientists that contributed to a radical reshaping of modern development economics. And the way we should approach policy issues related to economic and social development. For quite some time, this field was characterized by a severe lack of evidence about what works and what does not work. Banerjee and Duflo's approach has also led to a methodological revolution in development economics, the widespread application of randomized controlled trials. Similar to research in medicine and the pharmaceutical industry, for example, 
This approach is based on the random assignment of individuals who are villages or whole communities to a treatment and a control group. This random assignment ensures that in a statistical sense, the only difference between the treatment and the control group is the existence of the treatment. And this enables the researchers to truly identify the causal effects of the treatment. So if you are interested in better education methods, the best, the gold standard of doing this is running on randomized controlled trials or in abbreviation and RCT. If you are interested in better methods of health delivery, or if you are interested in measures for women's empowerment, an RCT is the way to go if you want to get the most rigorous knowledge. However, sometimes those among us who want to move the world in a better direction are tempted to believe that the success of certain measures is obvious. Isn't it obvious that if you provide households in a poor country with better cook stoves, that emit less smoke into the kitchen, isn't it obvious that this will improve the health of family members? Or isn't it obvious that if you want to build, more, that if you build more schools and employ more teachers, this will lead to better educated children? The problem with such statements is that what appears to be obvious is often not at all obvious. In the case of cooking stoves, an RCT, for example, showed a big RCT showed that health did not improve because the households stopped using their stoves after some time. Uh, in the education example, it turns out that in some countries, the children are often ill and can't attend school, or the teachers don't go to school. They are absent. Uh, so teacher absenteeism is a big problem in some countries. In their renowned book, Poor Economics, which is based on the insights from a large number of RCTs, they radically rethink the way we have been fighting poverty. They ask critical questions like, why would a man in Morocco who doesn't have enough to eat buy a television? Or why is it so hard for children in poor areas to learn, even when they attend school? The reason why it is so important to find the answers to such questions will be explained by you, to you by our speakers. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Esther and Abhijit. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's a wonderful audience. And um, I'm really, I hope I can measure up to the size and the, and the maybe the excitement that Master would have brought you here on a, on a, late on a Thursday night. Um, the, so what, um, what we decided to do is to kind of split the talk and in the spirit of always giving women the last word, Esther will have the last word, uh, what, what, what I would like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, about what, what we learned after we wrote this book. So this, we wrote this book in 2010-2011, and I think the book, book at that point was, you know, I think it kind of, we tried to uh, distill what we knew um, at that point about various issues of interest in fighting poverty. And of course, uh, you know, when you try to do that, you kind of make some guesses. And, it, and sometimes those guesses turn out not to be true. Uh, so so that, that, that's sort of the, the, what I'll tell you about is, you know, what, what kinds of guesses we made and, you know, where, where we went wrong and where sometimes we got it right as well. Um, but let me just step, step back for a second. I think, I think why, the reason why it's important to emphasize this process of, kind of guessing and succeeding or failing is that in a sense I think that's the structure of knowledge that we economists often resist. We want a, we, we, we want a kind of a, a simple formula which allows us to kind of reduce most things to you know clear and uh, relatively easily articulated answers and that, that has the consequence that we often close our mind to the world. We sort of see the world through the lens of whatever particular story that we have come to believe in. And because of that, we often don't react to 
to the world when he speaks to us. We don't listen to the messengers that don't come into our framework. So we start from an idea that the messenger must be of this kind, and we don't hear messages that are out there. A point we wanted to make in our book, and I think we, I think people took it took away from our book, was that you know if you open your ears and you look at things, the world will surprise you. It will both surprise you in terms of where the message is. It's not always where you look looking for it, and what the message is, and it's often what you don't expect. And so I, I think, and but of course, to not expect things, you need to start by saying something. You having having a guess about what what um, what uh, could happen. If you if you make no guess, then you can never be wrong. So we 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 are in the business of being wrong in a sense. I think it's one great advantage of social science done well is that we can be right and we can be wrong. And I think by being putting forward ideas that were potentially controversial from the beginning, uh, we we gave us a, ourselves uh, a chance to be wrong, and indeed we succeeded. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'll give you some examples of where we we got things right, some things we got wrong, some things where we didn't quite have the story uh, in full, and now I think in some ways we do. So let me get get to the beginning of that. Um, so here's here's one where I think um, we went out on a limb on something that was actually quite controversial. We got yelled at by many people for it. Uh, sadly, we were wrong. And that was, well, but, but we had predicted that it was going to be hard to improve nutrition through food subsidy programs. Basically, uh, what are food subsidy programs? They're programs that are, exist in many, many countries. They're programs even in rich countries where basically you, in, you get social support but in the form of cheaper food. And the reason why we thought that that wouldn't have big effects on nutrition is that a lot of people before that, and you know, that wasn't our work as much as many other people's work, but we were reading it, I think, carefully, and it was suggesting that when you subsidize food, well, what basically what you do is, you know, you give people, let's say, 10 kgs of rice uh, at a low price. But of course, they don't eat 10 kgs of rice. They eat 20 kgs of rice. So in some sense, at the margin, the last kg they buy, they pay the, pay the market price. So in some sense, therefore, when you change the, when you change the, uh, so when you give people a subsidy for rice, you, you basically, all you're doing is you're giving them a gift of a certain amount of money. You're not really changing the price of rice because it's changing you don't give them enough rice so that they can just buy a lot, uh, all the rice from the government. Typically, they'll buy some of it from the government, some of it from the market. So it doesn't really change the price. What changes is the income. And we kind of, and people had often tried to look at what economists call income elasticity of demand for food, which is basically what happens to the amount of money you spend on food when your income doubles. Does that double? Does it go up by 50%? And the answer is, a lot of people had found, a lot of very, I think, careful payer scholars had found that you know, when income goes up uh, by, let's say, income doubles, uh, food consumption doesn't double. It Maybe it goes up by 30 40 50 60%. And different studies had different numbers, but these numbers were discouraging. They were basically saying that you can give people lots of money and the food consumption doesn't go up very much. And we had written about why that might be the case, etc. Um, now, what happened since is that there were a bunch of programs that were carried out in different countries of the world where the poor were given a gift of money. So instead of looking at what happens when you get richer, we could look at what happens when certain people were given money, and often this was done as a part of a randomized controlled trial. So um, very large scale ones like the study of Progresa in Mexico. Uh, these were large scale conditional cash transfer programs, meaning people were given some amount of money with the expectation that they send their children to school. So these kinds of programs, so the people's incomes went up. And what we find surprisingly is that in fact, 
the extra money people do spend on food. So in other words, the first money people get, they often spend on televisions, but after they get more money, they spend it on food. It's exactly the reverse of what people expected. They, people had started and we had started with the presumption that you know, you first you buy your food, then you buy your television. Turned out it's the opposite. When you give people um, extra money, then they start spending on food. Now, why they do that, you could, do you, I mean, I, I think there are several potentially different stories of why they, they might do that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that the fact is kind of, now, very, very clear. So there's this very nice example of a, a program in Bangladesh which basically gives people um, a, a, just a bus ticket. Go to the city and get a job. So it's, it's worth $7. It increases calorie consumption by 50% over a period of uh, six months. So that's an enormous amount of, you know, the, the, the just the... the Income response there is, you know, people are really spending most of that money on food. And that's why you're getting that response. It's, it seems like people, so, and we've been sort of now speculating on what this means. What, I mean, one thing, it, one, one thing it does mean is that as we do see, as people have got from being very poor to being a little bit less poor, they actually are spending it more on food. And one of the things we do see is that uh, among the very poor, uh, childhood undernutrition is falling fast. And for example, in India, there are uh, the proportion of children under five who are undernutrited is goes has gone from 48 percent to 38 percent in in less than 10 years. So that's a they, they seem seems to be something going on where people are actually spending money on food. So that that's something that we had guessed wrong. Now, why did we guess wrong? I think there are several theories. One theory is that you know many of these programs target women, and women are are you know maybe more responsible than men. I mean, I, I'm sure, surely willing to sign on to that view. Uh, it turns out, however, there there is a at least one randomized control trial where they randomly chose the identity of the person to give the money to. So in Kenya, and this had no consequences. Exactly the same effect on consumption. People spend a lot of food. Men spend a lot of food, and men and women spend a lot of food on food. So that doesn't seem to be the answer. Another uh, theory, which may be more plausible, is that it gave, you know, when you give people some something and you say, well, this is for your children's future, people feel guilty in not spending it on, on that, and maybe that's the reason why it's going on. We have a, another theory, which, again, as I said, in the spirit of going out on a limb, uh, which will and maybe prove wrong again, uh, I would say our theory is that uh, is what Esther in a talk called hope as capability. So when you give people a program like this, where you say, okay, now on, you don't have to be that poor, they rethink their life. They think that my life isn't just a desperate struggle. I can plan for the future. I can think of the future as something that's accessible to me, not just I'm going to go from day to day and maybe, uh, you know, um, I'll survive till tomorrow. And, and what that does is it gives you a reason to invest because you think the future is actually a possibility for you. And I think that particular idea that hope is itself a resource, that, that's, I think, the reason why we think this we see this surprising reaction that people these programs gave people hope and hope actually generates somehow a more optimistic more long long looking behavior here's another story where we had gone out on a limb and here we were mostly right but i'll tell you where we went entirely right and it's interesting so microcredit was this um, we uh, was this great idea of around 2000. This was the flavor of the year. You know, microcredit was all going to solve all pro pro problems in the world. If you don't know what microcredit is, it's tiny loans to you know anybody who wants it um, at a relatively low interest rate, not low but not very high interest rate. So these were this idea was. You know, uh, Muhammad Yunus got the Nobel Peace Prize for coming up with this idea. It was it was a, it was seen as being the particular silver bullet of the early 2000s. Uh, we ended up looking at the data quite carefully. We did a uh, one randomized control trial, and I think 
it was very clear to us that it did, it doesn't seem to be doing didn't seem to be doing what was promised so we didn't find any on average we found no F, uh, evidence that this was making people richer so the poor stayed just as poor as they did that doesn't mean that this was i i, I this was a uh, 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 this was uh, necessarily a uh, 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 a bad thing. I'll come back to that. But I mean, now there are, there are randomized control trials in many countries, in uh, very different countries: Mexico, Bosnia, Mongolia, Ethiopia, India, Philippines, and you find exactly the same result. Exactly that the, in none of these countries do you find any evidence that is making people richer. And indeed, um, we 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 had this somewhat accidental randomized control trial of microcredit because we were trying to promote insurance uh, and people from Swiss Re might be we were trying to get people in particular we were going to get people to buy health insurance and the um, uh, way we did it was by pairing it with, with microcredit and said that to have microcredit you should have health insurance and what that did was people immediately abandoned microcredit and just gave up the insurance. They, they so hated the idea of having insurance for reasons that I don't think we understand entirely, that they gave up the opportunity to have microcredit. As a result, we ended up with a bunch of people who, acts kind of because we forced them into getting insurance randomly, they gave up microcredit. So we could look at what that does to their incomes, and we find exactly the same patterns. So, it's, so in other words... Losing microcredit doesn't make you poorer. Gaining microcredit doesn't make you richer. So, uh, so that, so I think we kind of know what what the answer is. And indeed, uh, one of our students did a beautiful job of combining all of these studies into uh, what uh, one meta-analysis, combining all of them. Uh, Rachel Meager, who's now a professor at the London School of Economics, and I think what you find is the I don't know whether you, this graph is, you know, speaking to you, but uh, the, if you look at those blue blue bars, they all cross zero, basically. And the reason why they all cross zero is because, uh, or the, not the blue bars, the red bars, uh, they all cross zero. And that's basically saying that you can't reject the hypothesis that didn't change anything in any of these cases. So this is a combination of all those studies, and if you put them together, you don't particularly find anything. That doesn't, I should, I want to say, this doesn't mean microcredit is useless. We try to say this, but nobody heard us, because everybody heard us basically attacking microcredit, so people stopped. It was very hard to get the second word in. You say, when you say, we, we think microcredit doesn't make people richer, but, the but, nobody hears the but, but the but is important, but it's, it's, it's money. So people, people isn't, you know, I, when I get a loan, it's not that I become rich. I become poor when I get a loan, but I do actually get benefit from it. I buy a house, and that's a good thing. The poor do the same thing. They get loans. They use it for good things, which is they buy whatever they want to buy. And if you look at the effect of this, when you stop microcredit, people start stop buying things, and when they stop buying things, the sellers get poorer. And that's, so it's, it's not that it's a bad thing. It just doesn't make you richer. It makes makes, uh, it's like any other credit, it helps you buy things. Um, now, here's where we were wrong. So, so far we were right. But there was something that was, we didn't notice, and if you look at this particular graph, this is, what this is saying is that these are basically, you know, quantiles, meaning this is the, the at the middle of the distribution, what happens to people who get microcredit and don't? Is, is it is the difference between them, the difference between them is essentially zero, if you look, look at there. That the, the, the brown line is at zero. But as you go to the extreme right, these are the people who had the best possible outcome, and there you see that the, there seems to be an uptick. There seems to be something going on. That is to say, the few people who were the absolutely the biggest beneficiaries potentially of microcredit, for them, there seems to be a positive effect. That, that, let me try to, that sounds tautological, uh, you know, biggest benefit, of course they have a positive effect, but let me try to explain w what that could possibly mean. Uh, and this picture suggests that there's really two places where something might have happened, one is at the bottom and at the top, in the middle, 
absolutely nothing happened. Um, but it, I think it's actually not, uh, not um, useless to sort of uh, step back for a second um, and go back to this, uh, this sort of question of who, who are those potential beneficiaries of microcredit. So one of, the, one of the things we did in this process of, um, is we started to look at, because we, these, we were, these things were jumping at us a little bit, you know, maybe somebody benefited, we started breaking up the people who, got, who were in our experiment between the people who had a business before microcredit arrived and the people who had a, started a business after. If you break up the population into those two groups, you suddenly start to see completely different things. So the people who started a business because they had cheap credit, they basically are, if anything, slightly worse off by starting the business. The people who started business had already had a business, so they didn't start a business because microcredit was available to them. For them, this, is, this really makes a big difference, and as we track them over time, you know, we, we've been tracking them over many years, so seven years later, uh, six years later, they are actually much richer than the people who didn't get the loan. So in other words, what, what's really, uh, what we had missed is that there was, while the av on average this doesn't do anything good, there are a group of people for whom this is a very, very good thing. And this was eventually, I, I'll, I, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so let me not uh, skip, the, uh, skip the curves. The curves are basically saying what I just said, that there is a group of people who are uh, very, uh, very specifically, you can identify them, you know who they are, and they do much better. Uh, a set of our students did the following. They went to the microfinance uh, finance organizations. Microfinance is organized in groups so that most, pe most people, the way it's organized is that five people or 10 people or 15 people borrow, borrow together. So this is organized in groups. Uh, we, we asked, they, what they did was they asked group members to predict who among the group is, is the best entrepreneur. Okay, so they, they, in a, instead of sort of just saying everybody's equally good, they said, do you know who's best? And to make sure that they actually didn't say it's me, they said, uh, you'll, you'll get a prize if everybody else agrees with your answer. So if you say you're me and you're not the best entrepreneur, your chance of winning was relatively little. So they managed to get the answer out. When you look at who, so most people actually agree who's a good, good entrepreneur. And then when you look at the, the rate of, so then what they do is they take these people and they give them a grant of $100. Each of them gets a grant of $100. So they're chosen at random. So some of those people who, who were claimed to be the best entrepreneurs got $100, others didn't. And then after a year, they can see if this made a difference. And it makes a huge difference. So in other words, the people everybody picked to be the best entrepreneurs have a rate of return of 25% uh, per month. And the people who people, uh, people picked as the worst group have a return of 0% per month. Uh, so in other words, this, is, this story is very, I think we had not quite understood how, how much diversity there is. You know, in some way, and this has a obviously extremely important implications. We should think of financing products which actually target the talented people and that not everybody is going to be a talented businessman. I think that doesn't seem like a surprise when I say it, but if you think of the philosophy of microcredit, it's to offer it to everybody, and uh, that does seem, uh, that's the reason why it didn't do what it's supposed to have done. Okay. I mean, uh, the last example I want to give is, you know, in, in our book, we, we talked a lot about poverty traps. We even have a, have a graph, the only graph in the uh, book uh, is a poverty trap. And what is the idea of poverty trap? The idea is that you're poor because you're poor. You, 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 if you're poor, therefore you can't get opportunities. If you don't get opportunities, you stay poor. That seems, uh, and we push this idea that this is this will if, very hard because it's the one really, you know, the great promise of a poverty trap is that it can be unlocked. If I can give you, if you are trapped because you're poor, then if I make you a little bit less poor, then you start on a virtuous, virtuous cycle. You get richer, and therefore you get richer. If you're poor because you're poor, then if you get richer, you can be even richer. So we were, we were looking for, we said this must be true, but we couldn't give a very compelling example. 
since then, we have one very, uh, very uh, nice set of studies. We were involved in them. The seven evaluations of the same intervention in seven countries. These interventions were was originally invented by a Bangladeshi NGO called BRAC. The intervention combines giving people, giving, not lending, giving people an asset with a lot of handholding, telling them, you know, this is what you do with the asset, don't be short-sighted, think about the future, etc. So they do a combination of these things. The whole program in India at that time cost about $400. Um, it varies a bit across countries, obviously, because some countries things are more expensive. When you look at the effect of that, this is the, uh, you know, in every country, and this is across the first, there are two bars here. The two bars are uh, after 18 months and after three years. Uh, and all the, in all the cases except one, and if you, if you have time later, I'll tell you about why that one didn't work. All, almost all of them have positive significant effects, often quite large. Incomes go up by 20%, 30%. And in fact, we've been following these people for quite a while now. Um, seven years later, these people are even richer. So it's not, not just that they got a little bit richer when you give them an asset, they got richer over time. They get the difference between those people who got the assets and people who don't keeps expanding over time. So in other words, we seem to have started the virtuous cycle. So the virtuous cycle exists, and uh, it seems to be e relatively easy to unlock it. So on that piece of good news, and that's one thing we did get right. So on that piece of uh, good news, let me hand over to Esther. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. It's a true pleasure. We have had a great... Uh, week here. Uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to take, just take two more examples uh, of uh, things that we talked about. Uh, one of them is education. And uh, I guess because I speak second, I have the right to say where we are we're really right. So education is when one where we got exactly right. Uh, in poor economics, what we had, it, in fact, it was a bit easy to get it right because this is where there had been the most research by the time we came in. There was really a lot, and I think there was kind of a consensus, so we were right, but perhaps we were not really out on a limb, at least uh, within uh, academics. But what we had uh, kind of identified as the primary problem uh, for uh, the, oops, sorry, Mr. Uh, because of the, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> What we had identified as a primary problem preventing kids to learn in school was pedagogy. Uh, so the problem that people had identified is that although many, many kids go to school, in fact, the enrollment rates are extremely high, at least in primary school in most countries, learnings level are very low. So in a country like India, for example, uh, by the middle of grade three or grade four, uh, about half of the kids can read a grade one very simple paragraphs. And this type of data we don't have for every country, but when we do have them are very similar. And what we had identified in programs, what we had said, what the problem is, is not that these kids are malnourished and they can learn. It's not that there are no teachers. It's not that the infrastructure is bad. It's not the lack of teachers. The problem is, it's not even absenteeism, although I have some work on absenteeism, and that's certainly not such, not such a great thing. But uh, it's a problem you find even in private schools where there is no absenteeism. So the problem, we've, we argued, was that the curricula were too ambitious for the people that were actually in school. And it was responsible for a school system that was a waste in two important dimensions. First, it was very bad at identifying talents. In fact, it was throwing out uh, most, of the, most of the children. And two, it produced very little learnings. And so we had based this, uh, these findings uh, on the basis of, uh, in some sense, some reduced form facts, which is that A, children don't learn very much, but B, it is reasonably easy to change that because uh, when uh, you have 
programs that focus on what has come to be called teaching at the right level, which is basically grouping kids not by their grade but by their uh, by what they know and focusing the teaching activity to that. So if a child doesn't know how to read, you go back and try and teach them to read before you teach them history. If they don't know how to count, you start the numbers before you go to nuclear physics. Those, fa those type of programs actually have a very large effect. And what we identified is that's an example of a classroom in Morocco. It's not a large classroom. So that's, in that case, not the problem. Sometimes you do have a very large classroom. This is a very small classroom, but it is very heterogeneous. So here you can see the heterogeneity in terms of age. Right? There is like an infant kind of uh, uh, in the classroom, although we have one here, and uh, uh, much older kids. But that heterogeneity is also across learning level when they arrive, the level develop support that they have home, etc. And yet the, the teachers teach to the top of the class. So in this case, it probably would be the older child. The teaching here would be in French uh, in, or in Arabic, this actually is in, in Arabic, in, a, in an area where everybody speaks Berber. Doesn't matter, the curriculum is that. The one child who speaks Arabic is in luck, the other ones are, are lost. So our evidence at the time came from this type of approaches. So in a sense, I was quite reduced from. It was like, oh, you have this very low learnings, but if you rearrange to teach at the right level, you, have, uh, you will get more learning. So that means that the kids are able to learn uh, and you just uh, um, you just can uh, uh, the 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 reason why they are not learning is because the school system uh, doesn't focus on what the what they know and doesn't try to get them what, where they can be. And since then, I think there are two much more direct pieces of evidence that have come. So the very micro micro that has come in particular from uh, collaborating with uh, cognitive scientists and, and psychologists. And I'll give you uh, one example in not too much detail is basically teaching at the right level in a fractal kind of a way. So working with computers uh, in class, in uh, after school program, actually in an after school program, it's just a, a project of uh, Kartik Moralidharan in India. It's an after school program, an hour a day or an hour and a half a day which uh, uses a simple machine learning algorithm to give people adaptive problems to wherever they are. So super adaptive. So you start with the kid, and then depending on how well they're doing, they get drills that are going towards what they need to work on more or, or not. And uh, Kartix uh, has uh, uh, found absolutely phenomenal results of that of that program, <coughs> suggesting that the more you go towards what kids don't know and push them there, the more gains you get. And then there are two other things which are looking directly as to what kids know and what the school, uh, the school system rewards. So this is not, these are not intervention studies. One of them is an intervention, but it's mostly about how kids know, how kids learn, and what does the school system reward. Uh, so the first one is a project that uh, I was involved with working with the psychologist, Liz Pelke, who is a psychologist from Harvard, which is asking simply, uh, where do you see more dots? Do you see more dots uh, on the red side or on the blue side? That's an example of, of that. That's a more complicated example. And then this is actually a game. So once the kid first uh, sorts the cards, and then when they are finished sorting the card, they can check their answers on the side. Here is another game of kind of a similar game. It's an addition, actually. This plus this equal the red side or the blue side? Red side. Um, so what we did is that, so this turns out that this is work from, that has been done from cognitive scientists, including uh, Lisa's lab and many others, showing that barring major disabilities, uh, kids have those skills. They have the ability to do this intuitive mathematics, uh, both uh, uh, from you know, starting in early childhood and then developing kind of on their own at the age uh, from the age of three or four. And then the the, both the parental background and the school system sort of plays on this or uh, leverage of this intuitive knowledge that the kids have in order to uh, impart more symbolic knowledge, uh, such as you know formal additions, etc. So what we did is that we uh, created a curriculum for kids uh, in uh, uh, slum 
who attend small uh, preschools in slum in India, where we uh, created those games. We actually piloted them in Cambridge, played them in, uh, and then played them in India and run randomized control trials or whether uh, on how, to measure both what the kids could do and then how much they could progress and whether uh, these gains would be uh, persistent and whether they would translate into further school games. And basically, we have uh, two big uh, findings. The first one is that, or three big findings, the first one is that these kids in India, they look very, very much like the kids in Cambridge. They just can't do the same amount. They are performing at the same level. The correlations between various uh, performance, etc., is the same. So by the age of three or four, we have kids that are uh, pretty similar. Second, these are uh, uh, skills that can be trained and that can be trained even in preschools with pretty like chaotic environment, etc. We managed to, those games that we played for a couple of weeks led to significant improvement uh, in those intuitive mathematics. Thirdly, the effect is very persistent in terms of non-symbolic test scores. You can see that for all this intuitive mathematics, the effect persists between the first end line and the second end line. If anything, it goes up. Uh, during the two end lines, so uh, six months later and one month later and one and a half, and, uh, sorry, six months later and then a year later, they have a larger effect and even larger effect after a year. However, there is absolutely no translation to the learning of school mathematics. And the, so what we think is happening there is that Although these kids are better at math at some fundamental level, the school system isn't recognizing it because the way you learn mathematics in, in school in India is more like poetry. It's like one times one, one, one times two, two. And the fact that you can actually add or is sort of irrelevant to that, uh, to that poetry. So that's one. Another thing that, another fact, so that you can improve people's actual mathematics sense in a durable way, and this does not translate into any gain in school math. The other thing is, uh, this is work that uh, Abhijit started to do in Kolkata, and then we did uh, together again with Liz in, uh, in, in Delhi, is to follow market mathematicians. So in many parts of the world, you, you go around and you see kids selling vegetables, and it's pretty clear that they are impressive at what they are doing. Uh, so we kind of uh, uh, documented that, that fact. Uh, so what we did is we sent surveyors to, uh, to buy, uh, to make a pretty complicated transaction. So they are buying two goods uh, from, the, from, the, from the person in, in an uneven quantity. For example, 300 grams of eggplant plus 150 grams of potatoes. So the transaction involves two divisions, two multiplication, an addition, and a subtraction. <laughs> this is a decoy person. We send three different decoy in... Uh, it's telling me I have uh, 10 minutes left, but that doesn't seem plausible. Um, it's... Um, uh, um, it's... Um, uh, so, the, so three times this, uh, someone comes and, and buys... And then, uh, then other surveyors that are not the same pull these same kids and ask them much more standard school math questions. And then progressively transitioning from the most concrete to the most abstract. And then I'll show you the result of that in a minute. But before that, I'll tell you what we did in the second study, which is we went and did the same thing with school children. So we first asked them standard math questions, and then we asked them the market math questions. And I'm sure from the way I led that, that you have an idea of where it is going at an intuitive level. But I still want you, pay, to, you to pay attention to the numbers because the magnitudes are quite striking. So what you get is that these are three mass transactions. You know, by the, the, the kids are between the lowest uh, average is 78% correct. In the second and third transaction, they are 94, 90, uh, 95% correct. Those are the market mass kids. Uh, <coughs> If they make a mistake and we correct them, then they're all correct. Secondly, is the school children do much more poorly on market math. Uh, and then the market adults are actually uh, less good than the market kids, <laughs> even though they have a lot of experience. And then when you look at the written, when you look at the formal math, 
only uh, these kids who can do division in their head, 17% of them will be able to do a division when it's presented in a formal way. And the school children, they don't do great, but they do much, much, much better. 57% of them are at the division level, which is the highest level. Uh, and then 40% uh, of the kids are, are the two-digit number. The only thing they can do is recognize two digit no better. And this is less for the, for the school children. So the market mathematicians do much better in market math, and they do much worse in school math. And then when you go from the most concrete to the most abstract, you can see their, their performance deteriorating. So why are they doing poorly? It's not because they have lots of good incentive in market math, but not when we do the school math, because when we incentivize the school math results, they don't do any better. It's not that they know the answer of market math by heart, but they, can't, they, were, they would not be able to do anything else. Because uh, when we give them concrete problems, but with different units and different things, so the, 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 the eggplant seller, if we give him tomato to, to sell in an abstract way, they can do very well as well. So they can do similar calculation with other prices. Uh, but what seems to be happening is that the market mathematicians don't seem to be able to use their knowledge to answer abstract school-like questions. In fact, they freeze. They're just saying, like, usually they're like, hey, you're asking me school math question. There is a reason why I've dropped out. I'm not good at math. <laughs> and on the other hand, the school children are incapable of using their abstract knowledge to any practical use. And the reason is that they take a very, very long time. And so usually they ask for a pen and paper, paper, and this is one pen. And so this is the child who multiplied 10 by however, 30. <laughs> and you can see that, that in the market, it's just not going to cut it. So here we are, in some sense, with these two examples, I think, really going inside this idea that there is, that there is talent out there, uh, there among the very small kids that is not used and not converted into formal knowledge, and then among these kids who clearly have the ability to do this calculation that is not, is neither used nor recognized. So I think we want to do much more now with going from that to practical, practical problems. Uh, here's the last example that we wanted to talk about, which is something which, in a sense, is overarching to a lot of our approaches. You know, we go to and ask um, market mathematicians to do some little transactions, etc. And often, a criticism we got a lot when, uh, uh, on poor, uh, you know, after and during poor economics, is that's very nice, small things, etc. But what about the institution, the system? This is really what changes the world. And, there, I don't want to know that we were right or we were wrong, but we are not changing our line of approach. We really think that the small things are hugely important, including for, for governance. And we've continued to, to do that. I think the poor economics chapter, was perhaps the most controversial statement is that, okay, general principles are nice, we don't mind them, but they are not sufficient to guide policy. What policymakers need and lack is guidance on the details to how to implement such policies. Uh, much more than, in general, you should have good governance. I, can, I tend to agree with that statement. But once that statement has been said, we are good. Very little has been said. So in the intervening years, uh, research, I think, has bolstered the case for the importance of what uh, I've come to call plumbing, which is that uh, the detail of public policy, not necessarily guided by deep principles, are often ignored both by academics and by policymakers and left to technicians. Who are, and then those details turn out to be uh, extremely, extremely important. And I'll give you very briefly two examples of that. Uh, one is a program where um, it is a massive program, this is Indonesia, which is known to be a very corrupt country, but despite being a very corrupt country, they're actually interesting in trying to reduce corruption, at least uh, uh, make sure that it's concentrated at the top, at the minimum. And therefore, the, there was an, uh, a request that came to Abhijit and Ben Ulken and uh, Rimahana to uh, look at the Rasking program, which is a program of uh, subsidized rice. Uh, and it's a program that uh, has a lot of corruption. Information about the citizen is low and Many people do not know that they are beneficiaries. When they are beneficiaries, they don't know the price they are entitled to. And as a result, the eligible only reserve about, receive about a third of the intended subsidies, the rest being dissipated in the form of 
and eligible getting the rise or the price is being too high. So what the government wanted to know, in a sense, is a complete plumbing question, which is keeping the structure of the program as such. Can we do small changes in the structure of the program to make it more transparent, and will that help? So what they wanted to do is to distribute this type of cards, which simply tell uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, Agus Budi, in this case, is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's his name in Indonesia, is a bit limited. Mr. So-and-so is eligible to this program. And then what the research team is that within this plumbing question, they introduce even more detailed plumbing questions, which is, oh, how about we add the price on the name of the card? How about we distribute the card? We, not only we distribute the card, but we let everybody know that cards have been distributed. Uh, how about we also give clip-on coupons uh, to, so that the person who, uh, the, the bureaucrat knows that there is accountability over there. And the reason I'm saying that is plumbing between, within plumbing is that there is very little, it's more intuition than general principle beyond information should matter or common knowledge should matter that uh, helps determine what might be the quantitative effect of these things. Of course, the direction you have a sense, but the quantitative effect would be more difficult to know. Uh, so here is an example just for the price. Uh, so this card looks very much the same. In fact, I hope I didn't get them wrong. Yes, but this one has the price. So it's a very, very small difference. So think of it as a, you know, normally the type of decision that you would not take at a very high level, whether there is this line. You know, your designer will take care of that. And what they find is that this sending out this uh, identification card had a huge improve, uh, increase on, on the subsidy in general, on the amount of subsidy that we, that we are getting, and that the very specific way in which the card is produced and distributed is, in fact, very important. And in particular, the price information really increased the, 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 the effectiveness of, the, of, of giving the card. Importantly, this was designed working closely with the Indonesian <coughs> government. It was designed in response to a request. So it was then scaled up almost immediately after the result is. So one of the things that we were already doing at the time of program is we are doing more now, is trying to make ourselves generally useful uh, to policymakers. There is another way in which you can make yourself useful, is to tackle problems that are maybe not so much detailed, but that are kind of left in the background. And one of them is the flow of funds. Like, how does money go to point A, from point A to point B within the government? So you would think it's like the most boring accounting questions you could ask. But in fact, I want you to think of this as a very important, very potentially very exciting question. So what we looked at is a workfare program. The typical workfare program, the local government will ask money to the block, which will ask money to the district, which will ask money to the state, and then finally the money will be approved and go to the savings account. Uh, what we looked at is a reform they implemented where this was replaced by something much simpler, where the local government logs in electronically, makes a request, and gets the money immediately. Now, the difference is that if they make a request directly, instead of saying, hey, please give us some money, they have to say very specifically that they want money to pay Mr. David or Mrs. Esther or Mr. Abhijit. So the, one, the, the possibility is that it would increase accountability because it increased the, it, you have really have to, put, to be very precise about what you are using the money for and therefore it is much easier to check. So this is kind of in the bowel of governments and not the type of thing that you would think of even when we think about like incentives of people or whatnot. And what we find is that that has a very large effect on spending. This is the spending where we did in the treatment group, spending in the control group. Of course, if, if this was because they did less, it would be a problem. But you can see that there is no effect on, uh, there is no effect on actual work under the program. And in fact, there is a large effect on the wealth of the people who are implementing the program. So the missing, missing money actually comes mostly from these people's pockets, and we can sort of find it directly. So ultimately, what have we learned uh, since uh, poor economics? We have been in even more convinced. Uh, we got some things wrong, many more than we discussed today. Something right. Uh, probably we identified all of them and discussed them today. Uh, but we were, I think, right on, on something fundamental. 
Uh, we, as economists, have some tools to help policymakers understand the problems they face better. We have some tools like plumbing tools. We understand incentives probably better than most people. We understand now, thanks to people like Ernst, the interplay of psychology and economics. We understand the role of information. So these are kind of not like, these are not more important than other things, but these are the things we happen to know about as economists. And increasingly as economists, we get a chance to intervene in the world. And I think we should not be shy to have the fact that we do have some things that we do know and we can use them to intervene in the world. But if we want to do that, then we have to be willing to take on board the fact that it will take a considerable share of mudding too. It's not going to be very easy. And if we want to be useful, we'll have to get our hand dirty. Dirty into trying things that we don't even know exactly why they might work or not and what, that we might get a sense of why things are the way they are only a little bit later. And we, the hope, and this is a little bit kind of what we tried to do with poor economics at the time, is that by, get, by being relentless about details, we are creating little pixels that will form into an image, and we may more likely to ultimately get the big picture right. So some of the conjectures that we did on the basis of this pixelation turned out to be right after all. Uh, some of them were wrong, but then maybe we will get them right uh, next time around, or maybe you will get them right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this really interesting and thrilling talk. I have a very small question, but since we're working in a program in Honduras, I still wonder why the poverty trap escape did not work in Honduras. Excellent question. I hope somebody would ask that. So the, uh, the reason why it didn't work is that, I mean, remember what this program does is gives people assets. What assets do people usually want? They want animals of some kind. That way, you get, if you get a cow, you get milk from it, or you can sell the calf. In Honduras, they wanted chicken. And what we learn from this, the, when we get to the plumbing, this is an example of plumbing, is don't give chicken. The reason why you shouldn't give chicken to people is where chicken are, get infectious diseases. They live together, and, they, and bird flu is extremely, extremely infectious. So they all got bird flu, flu and died. That's the sad story of what happened. So I work um, in a social enterprise in Guatemala doing biofortified corn. And um, I think that your guys' presentation and everything you've been able to achieve over the last decade is incredible. And even beyond that, I think the accountability for big aid and government and looking at solutions that are kind of already largely at scale and being able to evaluate how to tweak them or change them is incredible. Um, but I think in the world of social entre entrepreneurship, this is a huge tension for us. Because normally we have a brand new idea, something that hasn't been scaled before. And it, sometimes it's a tweak of something that has been done in the past but hasn't been trialed before. And we're stuck between these two different extremes. On one hand, I think that there's a growing pressure that if you don't have an RCT yet, you shouldn't be funded. And I think on the other hand, there's this kind of pressure back from people like maybe Kevin Starr from Malago Foundation who says, don't bet the whole farm on a single RCT. Because sometimes it takes a couple RCTs to figure out an answer to a question. And sometimes you have to tweak your intervention first. And so to make the whole question really concrete, what I want to say is, how do you recommend to social entrepreneurs or those behind new ideas find the right amount of evidence at the right time? And how should new organizations with new ideas and tiny budgets, sometimes less than half a million dollars, respond to the growing idea that if you don't have an RCT yet, or 10 RCTs yet, you probably shouldn't get funded? Well, I think that the way that uh, a lot of people have been approaching that, uh, for example, uh, uh, DIV, a US, USAID Development Impact Venture, is, is this idea of stages. So when you just start, uh, like very much like for a, um, a, like a, an actual product, when you just start, you need to first figure out figuring out what it is that you are doing. So you might need, you know, hundred thousand dollars to try things out on a small scale, figure out whether people love you out of town anyway, etc. And so that's this one. This is not the, usually it depends because some programs are very easy and cheap to do an RST on, but usually not the stage where you would do one. 
And then when you have something that you think is like kind of a little bit more, and, and these amounts of money is actually not very difficult to get from uh, various people who like social entrepreneurs. And then there is a second theory you become a bit bigger. And then there are kind of two ways to go. When usually with the idea of social entrepreneur is the idea that I can actually make just scale up without your money. Uh, then this idea is, can you really, can you? Like, you know, try to sell your thing in a way that anybody buys it. Okay, you should then, you know, there are people who will give a little bit more equity once the product actually exists. And then, in a sense, maybe at this very moment, you don't need the RCT yet because, after all, at this point, the claim that you are making is I can sell the object. If, on the other hand, you want to say that this is something that maybe there is no profit to be making out of it, but it's still something one should do, then this is a stage where you will want an RCT at some point. And then if you've already demonstrated that your thing is plausible in the first place, it's also the stage where you're more likely to get the money for an RCT. And that by that point, you know, in the first one, you're going to try very many things, but by that point, you should have sufficient amount of confidence that you, you're willing to bet your, 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 your eggs into this one, into this one basket. And then, of course, it becomes the moment where you have a great success and you want to scale up, and then you are going to go for a stage three, which might even not take another RC team, it might just take trying the thing on a very large scale. Uh, I may add one thing to that. I also <laughs> believe that uh, it's great to do what everybody else has done. I mean, I, I think there's maybe too much innovation in the world sometimes, and uh, there is... Uh, um, Often, if you, if you have a small budget, uh, I guess my uh, suggestion is often, think, if I, there's now enough evidence on some things, uh, pick up one of the things that someone else has done and do it well. And that's, uh, since that's already been demonstrated, it makes a lot of people better off. I think we, uh, I try to always say that, you know, there's, uh, you know, innovations are, are, are wonderful, but, uh, you know, only if they're replicated. If everybody constantly innovates, then we get nowhere. RCTs are, are kind of well suited for testing, you know, one factor and whether one factor produces a change in outcomes. And I suspect that policymakers and journal editors like when you have a study that shows that one factor produced a change in outcomes and you can identify what that factor is. But, you know, thinking through what you talked about, like, for example, with respect to education, where, you know, kind of what you, part of what you seem to be saying is that it's not absentee teachers, it's not class sizes, it's, you know, curricula. I mean, it, it could be all of them, right? It could be that basically what you really need are interventions that decrease class sizes, you know, have teachers show up, give the students, you know, money so that they can, or not give the students money, but the school's money so they can, you know, pay for materials and improve curricula. And that, you know, rather than kind of looking for one factor at a time, what, you know, maybe needs to be the focus is more on kind of combinations of big interventions and change lots of things at a time. And I, I don't know, you know, the development work that well to know whether people are doing that or not. But I'm wondering just what you think about that and if, if there is kind of our studies that focus on that. Manny, well, this is, the reason why I know what I said is because those studies have been done. So in a sense, those studies, these things have been tried together in combination, separate, uh, isolated, etc. So in that sense, you can try one factor at a time. You can try many factors at a time. Uh, great value of the fact that many people are working on related projects is that you actually combine the evidence from various things. So, uh, for example, we do know that uh, cutting the class size and making the teacher come more in and of itself is not as effective uh, if it doesn't go with a change in pedagogy, for example, through tracking. And that I know because we've done the study by doing it in this completely combinatorial way. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes things can be combined, but again, the, the same tools uh, work for combined things the way they work for individual things. I mean, let me add to that. I, mean, I think that the example I gave of the, uh, the program that sprung people from the poverty trap, I think one, we also did the pieces of it. So, oh yeah. Uh, we also did the pieces of it, so it was all. We also did bit by bit. So, for example, we just gave you the asset, 
and none of the hand-holding. It doesn't do anything. We give you the, just the savings opportunity, but none of the others. It doesn't do anything. So we did all of the pieces of it, and you can see exactly which piece. You need to do all of them together. So it's not that I have a particular view that one thing is better, you know, it has to be a single factor other than 14. It's just whatever works. For me, the most interesting part was the dilemma between the market mathematician and the school mathematician. So my question would be, after this finding, which is really f somehow shocking and frustrating, that there are so many good mathematicians out there that somehow don't make it in school, and even vice versa, which was really interesting, um, what have you done, or can you let a bit, a bit, who has picked up this topic and is something being done about it? Because this looks like a quick win where we could find a solution and really make something out of it. Uh, so if you have an idea for a solution, come talk to us. <laughs> Because uh, this is something, this is very much where we want to take it, uh, the three of us and with, you know, anybody who wants to talk to us, uh, is Pratham, except some of our partners in the field is thinking, now that we have this, we know this fact, uh, how do we, uh, can we think of uh, educational interventions that are based on this fact to address, for example, the fact catching the market mathematician before they drop out and kind of leverage and, and uh, uh, recognize the, their, their knowledge. To be honest, we are thinking about it. We have uh, We, we, we are trying to talk to various people about it. We haven't come to something that is uh, that that, that is you know, strikes to us as, as the next thing, next best thing since sliced bread yet. But uh, but it, it, you're exactly right. The next step is we want to and and these results are built on new. It. Yeah, well, one, this this is research that's. <laughs> It's like, Some uh, of it is not even written up, so it's really like this fresh year. Fresh off the oven. The, uh, you know, the, we saw them a month ago. Some of them. So this was a lot of very inspiring information, and I can imagine from the young people here in the room or people who watch it on the video later, many will ask themselves, if I want to contribute to this progress, either in practice or with research, what should I do now as a young person to prepare myself to be able to make a difference? What would you recommend to a young person? He wants to collect. In the spirit of asking very pragmatic questions, um, if you had $10 million, dollars, what would you spend them on and why to reduce poverty? Just $10 million. <laughs> so I'm at Swiss Re. And I am interested in, um, you said with the microcredit that people were actually really discouraged to take up microcredit when they offer health insurance. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that, what, what are some reasons. And also in general, what role can industry play in making some use of these RCTs? I can take the insurance question. Uh, so, uh, I, I would rather. Take <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted me to take no, ten million is very 10 easy. Million, oh, ten million, ten million, any, any, any day. Like ten million, you really uh, at this level, you really have a lot of choices. I'm assuming you don't want. To, you're, you're talking about a specific program. You can always give it to Poverty Action Lab, but I assume that's not what you have in mind. Uh, but. Uh, Uh, for, I don't think there's anything in mind. <laughs> at, at the level of, of, of 10 million, actually, there, is a, there are programs that operate at the scale where they can easily absorb 10 million that are, that, uh, are known to be extremely effective, extremely cost-effective, a high rate of return. So uh, you could do, uh, the, the, you could do um, this, the thing that justified what we found in education, all the remedial education thing, targeting at the, you know, Uh, teaching at the right level, these are very cheap interventions that uh, have a tremendous effect on, uh, on test scores. You could spend 10 million on that and you would have, you know, it would be 10 million very well spent. Ultra poor programs, reasonably expensive, <laughs> very, very high rates of return, you would spend 10 million very easily. So at the level of 10 million, I think there is actually a range of things that people could choose from uh, depending on whatever strikes their, their, their fancy. Uh, coming to Dina's question, I mean, I, I think that, uh, and maybe you can add to it, I think, I mean, if they 
for example, uh, I assume that they are not, uh, you know, if they could come to the University of Zurich and study um, development you. economics <laughs> with you, then that's the right thing to do. Uh, assuming they can't, uh, we have now um, put uh, five courses online, um, which are go from how to do an RCT to quite detailed understanding of of I, both data uh, measurement and economics, of development economics. There are five courses online. They're available for somebody who doesn't want a grade. They're available free for people. We, uh, they're on the MIT X platform. And uh, if you and even if you want a grade, it's they're not expensive. So it's it's. It, I think it, that would be one one. I want to advertise those because those courses are, um, you know. Are we? I mean, may, I think all of them, except one, the one or the other of us lectured in them. Uh, so, so where it, do people find that online? Uh, on the edX platform, so edX, ED. and then and yeah. then, then and are, MITx, and then they are they are available. They are run as classes, so on semesters basis, but they are run three times a year, uh, and so they are available. Either, you can do them individually. Or you can do them as a package, in which case they lead to a micro to a micro masters. A degree, so you actually can get a degree from them as well, um, and <coughs> sort of then. So we've sort of tried to make this material as easily available as possible. Hopefully, maybe some people will be inspired to actually look at them. Um, on the insurance question, finally, so this story is in our book, um, and the story is. Um, so sort of we discussed why didn't they want insurance? And in a sense, it's, I think it, it helped us to think about it from their point of view. And that, that was helped by a woman who uh, bitterly complained about um, some friend of hers who had bought the insurance. Her husband was insured. Her husband felt very sick. And uh, they spent lots of money on medicine. And then he eventually died. Um, she went to make a claim. And the claim was denied correctly, as it turned out, because it was a hospitalization insurance. And while he was very sick, he was never hospitalized. Sad story, but I think what it told us is that, you know, the, the, we sort of think of insurance contracts as well. Here are these, these are the exclusions. This is the, uh, this is the you know, this is how much you're going to have to pay, uh, uh, to etc. Uh, and these things, we think of these as being sort of simple things. And I'm trained in economics. I see them as simple. I think from the point of view of the client, these are mysterious things. And you tell them that, you know, this condition is covered, but that condition is not covered. This is the, this is this you know pre-existing thing is not covered these kinds of things makes it extremely difficult for people to navigate so i think people actually find these products kind of they think it's fraud and not not because it's fraud i, I don't want to say it's at all i think it, the, the the product was actually just fine we looked into it the product seemed actually a good product it was not that it was just that i think from their point of view they think oh this is all rigged for me to not get it and then, of course, this is self-fulfilling because a few people, uh, in this case, it was really self-fulfilling because too few people signed up. So eventually, uh, the organization really tried to get anybody to sign up. So eventually, they were actually, the people who signed up were people who had intention to defraud to the whole thing. So the insurer got super upset and then canceled the whole thing. So exposed the, the fear of the people turned out to be correct. Uh, uh, partly because they, they're self-fulfilled. Maybe to, to finish, I'll just uh, say a bit more on, on Dina's question. So I think uh, this shameless uh, self-advertising was kind of one, one part of the thing that the first thing I always tell to young people is you, got, you have to educate yourself in one thing that uh, interests you in within, it could be many, more than one thing, but at least focus one one topic, something that is that you're, you want to learn more about and go deep, you know, you're, you're smart, you have lots of resources, and then you can, the more you understand, uh, the better, because a lot of the waste um, comes from misunderstanding, a little bit like in this case, although in this case it was kind of honest misunderstanding. But. The second thing is, I think, like energy, <laughs> spent something, some effort, raising money, going there to you know, visit the developing countries, uh, 
maybe even if it's just as a tourist to start with, and maybe yeah, you can find <coughs> internship, uh, some volunteering in an organization, actually being a research assistant for someone, etc. But just you know, pay with your body and with your soul, and then you're getting even more out of it. Uh, and then I think from there on, you'll be in a position where you'll be able to decide what you want to do with your life, which might be to do sort of the, along the line of uh, effective altruism, going to make a lot of money and give it to someone else, or, uh, or stay in that, in that line of trade, because there is also a fulfillment in that, which is the, the choice that uh, we made. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be